welcome you on this Sunday morning, Mother's Day. For those of you who are here today because your mom dragged you to church today, it's Mother's Day. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Mission Community Church and so glad that you are here with us. Uh, as we dig into God's Word this morning, just to catch you up to where we've been the last several weeks, we've been looking at the lives of the apostles and, and, and looking specifically at some of their, their flaws, some of their shortcomings and how God has used those things, Jesus used those things to, to turn those, those shortcomings into new passions, new desires, and, and how he can even take the, the, the worst of the worst, redeem that life, and use it for his honor and glory. And sometimes it's, it's in the messiness that as we make it through the mess and as God redeems those situations in our lives, as God redeems our flaws, it, it gives other people hope that Jesus is still in the business of redemption. He still wants to get us in our shortcomings and use them for his honor and glory. So we, we think of uh, the apostles John and James that we already talked about. They're, they're brothers in, in the New Testament and they're referred to as the sons of thunder. And these guys had, had a short fuse. They, they, would, they would go to battle in an instant. They were ready to rain down fire on a village just for rejecting Jesus. They, they were very passionate, and yet God redeemed the qualities about James and John and, and ended up using them to, to further his mission, to further his gospel. We look at a guy like Peter when Pastor Dennis uh, preached on him a couple of weeks ago and, and how Peter's always this guy that's, that seems to be doing the right thing, but then just a couple verses later, he finds a way to mess it up. And I mean, even if you think about like when, when, when Peter is in the garden with Jesus and the guards come to, tr to arrest Jesus and, and Peter's ready to fight and he, he goes and he takes the guy's ear off, like how, how do you just get an ear? Like, what, did he go this way? Like, how did you not get his shoulder? Like, he just can't ever really do anything right even when he does do it. And yet Peter... Jesus says that on, on this rock, on this confession of faith, when, when Peter says, you are the Christ, he says, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. We look at a guy like Andrew last week, and, and Andrew is one of these guys that everybody knows, but really nobody remembers. Like, like what did Andrew do? You know, he was in that circle with Peter, James, and John, but he, he's kind of like this fifth wheel, and He's always bringing people to Jesus, and there's nothing really negative said about Andrew, yet he's the guy that's just working behind the scenes, doing his thing. He, he has this administrative bent. He, he's just got this servant type of a heart that's just looking out and seeing what he can, can do for God's glory. And today we look Now, there are a couple of Phillips in the Bible just to kind of define who we are talking about today. When you read through the New Testament, there's a couple of Philips that are referred to the sons of Herod. Uh, we're not talking about those Philips. There's also a Philip in the book of Acts. And, and most scholars, most theologians believe that, that the Philip in the book of Acts is different from Philip the disciple. You see the Philip in the book of Acts, if you remember that story in Acts chapter 6, he's bringing the Ethiopian eunuch uh, to Christ, and then he goes and baptizes and and so that's not the Philip we're talking about today. We're talking about Philip, one of the disciples. And, and Philip is, is usually, when, when looking at the list of the disciples, he's listed as number five. And a lot of times he's, he's really kind of the leader of that second group of disciples. So you have Peter, that's primarily the leader of Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And then you have Philip, who, who's leading the second group of four. Bartholomew's in that group, who we're going to talk about next week. Or he also goes by the name of Nathaniel. But let's just introduce ourselves a little bit to Philip. If you, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to John chapter 1. And before we read John chapter 1 and, and introduce ourselves to Philip, Philip is one of these guys who's kind of realist, he's maybe a pragmatist, he, he kind of sees like how things ought to be done and, and just, you know, thinks logically about those things. You know, I relate to, to Philip, I, I'm the type of guy that, 
that like if I see an issue or I see a problem, okay, you start just listing down X, Y, Z, this is how you solve this issue. And he's, he's very calculated. He's very formulaic. Th- this is Philip. This is, this is who we're talking about. And, and when we see Jesus interacting with Philip, Jesus is specifically getting after his pragmatism. He, he's going after Philip's faith. And, and Philip is there with his hands up just, this doesn't make any sense. And so I've I've almost entitled this message today, Making Sense of No Sense. Making sense. Say, you, you're, you're not making any sense. You're not making any sense. Us husbands, like, sometimes we look at our wives like, you're not making any sense. I don't, what are you talking about? Making sense of no sense. In John chapter 1, verses 43 through 46, we read this about Philip. This is really kind of his preface, so to speak. It says, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was, one, was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? We're going to dig into that phrase next week because there are some prejudices that Nathaniel has that, that God ends up redeeming for his honor and his glory, but that's for next week. And then Philip said to him, just come and see. Come and see. And whenever I think about Philip, Philip is, is really the only disciple or, or the first disciple, I should say, that, that Jesus actually went out looking for and found him. All the other disciples kind of come to Jesus. You know, there's Andrew and John with John the Baptist. Jesus walks by. John the Baptist points out Jesus to, to John and Andrew. And, and so John and Andrew just kind of turn and, and, and follow after Jesus. Andrew brings Peter to Jesus. And now here's Philip. And it says that Jesus found Philip. So we also, almost have to assume that, that Jesus was looking for Philip. A lot of times when we read through the, this passage of Jesus calling the disciples, we think that, that Jesus didn't know these people from Adam, that they were complete strangers. All of a sudden, he comes up on whatever it is they're doing. He says, hey, follow me. And they just immediately drop their nets and follow this stranger that they've never met. I would, I would suggest to you that, that there was some sort of relationship that had occurred with Jesus and these guys prior to him calling them to be disciples. I mean, why else would, would Jesus go looking after Philip? Now, yes, God is sovereign. Jesus is sovereign. He knows all things. And so he, he probably had a plan and purpose for, for Philip even before he was born. But, but as you read through some of the context, even, even Andrew and John being disciples of John the Baptist, there is a knowledge of Jesus. There is a, a knowledge of, of, of this Messiah. And as they're living in this area of Nazareth, of the Sea of Galilee, Galilee there, there's most likely a connection there. But it says that Jesus went and found Philip. Philip turns and, and then goes after his friend Nathaniel. Say, hey, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah, the, the one that the Old Testament prophets had been talking about. We, we, we found him. Come and see. So I even think here, Philip's not really pragmatic yet he he still recognizes something about jesus there's something about the, his interaction there's something about his presence that awakens him to to who he is but then we we get to see a little bit of philip's pragmatism as we continue through the gospel of john john is really the only writer that records anything about philip we we see philip in a, in a list of all the other in all the other gospels but but nothing really specific to him and so we have to look at really two passages in the gospel of john to really learn a little bit more about philip and so if you have your bibles i invite you to turn to john chapter 14 john chapter 14 and and this is where Jesus begins to give us a little bit of insight of, of just Philip and his, his pragmatism, his, his rationality, his, his logical thinking. John chapter 14, verse 1, it says this. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
Now you have to understand what, what's going on here. here. Here's Jesus with his disciples. They're in this upper room. They're sharing this last meal. This is just, just before hours before Jesus is arrested and, and taken to trial. And so leading up to this specific point in the conversation, there are three things that Jesus had already told the disciples that, that's leaving them anxious, leaving them questioning what's going on. Jesus says that, that he will die. And this completely goes against what, what they thought he for the Roman Empire. The second thing is that Jesus will be betrayed by one of them. And so they start talking. They start talking through different, um, different disciples. And who's going to be the one that betrays? Is it I, Lord? Is it me? Is it me? And they start asking each other, is it you? Is it you? Just bear with me for one moment as I switch this over. Jesus will be betrayed by one of them. And then the third thing that Jesus talks to his disciples in this upper room is that Jesus announces to Peter that you're going to deny me three times. They're having this conversation, who's going to betray you? Peter says, I'm never going to betray you. And Jesus looks at him and says, no, no, actually, you are. Before the alarm goes off, you're going to deny me three times. And so, so the disciples are anxious. They're worried. And Jesus gives them this command, let not your hearts be troubled. It, it's, a, it's a present imperative. It is a command that's in the passive voice. So in other words, it's like, stop stressing out, which tells us that, that we are in control of our emotions, that when we find ourselves in seasons of stress, of anxiety, of despair, that, that there are things that we can do to control our emotions. And, and Jesus is saying to the disciples, stop stressing. Let not your hearts be troubled. That God doesn't give commands where we don't have the capabilities to follow through those commands. So he, here's the context. Let not your hearts be troubled. And, and there's really three reasons that Jesus goes through this John chapter 14 passage of, of why they can be sure of who Jesus is and, and how they can be sure to, to let not their hearts be troubled. It's, it's because of who you know. Like, like, remember who it is that you're with right now. He says in John chapter 14, verse 1, the second half, believe in God, believe also in me. They have been doing ministry with Jesus for three years, seeing him do incredible things. I mean, incredible things. Like, you believe in God. Believe also in me. Like, I, like just by nature of what I've done, you should have confidence in, in who I am. Another reason why you can be confident in me is, is because of where you will go. He continues in verse 2, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? In the New Testament, and, and specifically Jesus, he talks on heaven 532 times. And here specifically, he, he talks about heaven in, in more of a relational context than a, than a geographic one. He's talking about, you know, in my father's house, there are many rooms. Some versions in, of the Bible, specifically the, the King James Version, they say many mansions. You know, I've been taught this all growing up in, in my church context, in my church background, that, that God is preparing me this, this big, gigantic mansion in heaven. And then, and then as you look at translations, as you look at just better you know, languages and tools that we have to uh, decipher what this, this Greek language is all about, it's a better translation is really rooms, many rooms. It, uh, it kind of disappoints me a little bit. I was like, I was ready for a mansion. You know, I was ready to, you know, kind of pull up this long driveway, like statues of myself welcome me on the way in, like golden trim. But, but no, it's, it's this relational. Now, don't let, an actual better translation is apartment. <laughs> that I go to prepare an apartment for you. Does that disappoint anyone? But I would rather take God's apartment than the devil's mansion. That, that this apartment is way bigger than, than the concept of an apartment that we have today. Think about this, that, that in Revelation, that the, John gets this vision of heaven, and, and this is what we know about, about this vision of heaven, that 
that, do you know that this earth that we live on today is going to be destroyed one day? And that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And, and in Revelation, it talks about this new Jerusalem. And, and it's kind of like this, this. Now, let me just say this. If you're not a Christian here today, this is going to sound a lot like sci-fi weird stuff. I get that. I'm with you on this. But this, this is what this picture of this new Jerusalem looks like. That, that this new Jerusalem, Revelation 21, that it comes down kind of like its own planet. And, and John says that it's 12 thousand furlongs in all directions it, it's not even a round planet it's like a cube all like the star wars junkies are starting to be like okay i'm, I'm tracking that that in it, it, it's it's twelve thousand furlongs in all directions that's fifteen thousand miles cubed that's two million two hundred and fifty thousand square miles 15 times the size of London. That's, that's just new Jerusalem. That's not even the new heaven, new earth. That's just new Jerusalem. And so there's this guy named Henry Morris that kind of describes it this way with all these calculations. He, he says that, that you could safely take on 20 billion inhabitants while only utilizing 25% of this planet for dwelling places. The remaining 75% would be for whatever, culture, farming, all, all these other things. That there's this belief in our eternal state that, that much like Jesus' resurrected body, that we'll, we will be able to travel both horizontally and vertically. And th this is just the capital city. That, that we will have a lot of room in this mansion. It's not like this little apartment complex that we're thinking of today, yet it's in this relational aspect not necessarily just geographic, that, that we can be confident because of where we will go, but we'll also we can be confident because of what he'll show us. Listen to this in verse 3, that, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Colleen went out last night with her grandparents and some of her aunts and um, just had this Mother's Day dinner. And, you know, me being the good husband that I am, once a year I, I try to make things good for, for Mother's Day. And she's out, and as she's out, me and the kids are, are trying to prepare the house for her. You're trying to get things clean, somewhat orderly, get some laundry done, have the kids put their stuff away. We're, we're trying to prepare the house. God spoke the, the whole earth into existence in six days just by speaking it. Jesus said that he's going to prepare a place for us over 2,000 years ago. So if he is preparing a place for us and has been doing that for the last 2,000 years, he spoke the whole earth into existence in just six days, we can't even, grab, we can't even get a taste of what this new heaven and new earth is going to look like. It's going to look way better than a clean house, laundry folded, dishes put away. Like we have no real conception of, of what this will be like. He goes to prepare a place for us. Just imagine what that would be like. Now we're getting somewhere here because we're, we're getting to Philip. Just hold on for a minute. John chapter 14, verses four through six, it says this. And you know the way to where I am going. So I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know the way I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know where you're going? And I just love Thomas and his response in that. Like, like we have no idea where you're going. What, what are you talking about? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He, Thomas is asking the question that everybody's thinking. He's, he's just saying out loud what, everything, what everyone else is thinking in their minds. Verse 7 and 8. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know me and have seen me. Enter Philip. Enter some of his pragmatism. He says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. 
If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know me and have seen me. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father. And it is enough for us. I'm just thinking realistically here. Show us the father. And that'll be enough for us. Like if you think about the Old Testament, they're always wanting to see the father. They're always wanting to see God the father. Just show us the father and it will be enough for us. I'm very much the same way. Like, like, just show me, and it'll be enough for me. Allow me to see it, and it will be enough for me. Just allow me to experience it firsthand, and it will be enough for me. Philip's pragmatism is actually revealed a little bit earlier when Jesus is feeding the 5,000, the 20,000 people. In John chapter 6, we get a little bit more up-close uh, example of, of this. In John chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, Jesus tells his disciples to go on the other side of the lake to take a break. We need to get together and kind of learn what we've been doing. They've been out teaching. They're tired. And then he says in in John chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Verse 6, he said this to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. So what's going on here? So that Jesus tells him to go to the other side of the lake to take a rest. The crowd finds out where Jesus and his disciples are going to be. The crowd actually beats them to this place before Jesus and his disciples get there. Even during this Passover where there's more people in the area, there's people traveling to Jerusalem to to commemorate Passover that Jesus still has compassion for the people. He turns to Philip and say, hey, Philip, where are we going to get money to feed these people? I mean, why why did Jesus ask Philip to begin with? Well, if you remember back in John chapter 1, Philip is from Bethsaida where they are gathered at this point in the story, that they're in the northeast corner of the the Sea of Galilee, not too far away from Bethsaida. And so I I would imagine that that Jesus is testing Philip specifically, that he knows where all the the taco mayas are and the chipotles and the In-N-Out burgers. Like, hey, Philip, where are we going to get all the food to feed these people? Philip knowing the resources and and being kind of like the accountant type of a personality, starts doing all the calculations in his head, starts formulating, starts looking at the crowd, trying to figure out, okay, how how could we do this? 20,000 people, I don't know a a restaurant big enough for that. He eventually blurts out, there's not even 200 denarii, 200 days worth of food, eight months worth of wages, wouldn't even buy enough bread to, to even give people a little taste not even to curb their hunger. And Jesus specifically said this to Philip to test him, to test his pragmatism, to to see if, hey, are you going to trust me? Are you going to have faith in me? And he, he fails this test. Now, I don't think Philip was doubtful. I think there's a difference between doubt and, and pragmatism. Like Thomas, he, he was the one that we typically recognized as the one who was doubting. But, but Philip, he, he was more of a, of a realist. And, and hence, he, he's still trying to find a solution, but trying to find a solution by his own means, his own ability. And, when, and what he missed is that, is that when you add God to any equation, that, that equal sign turns into a whatever. So it's not just five loaves and two fish equals seven. It's it's five loaves and two fish plus God equals 20,000 remainder 12. That when you add God into whatever equation, into whatever impossible situation, that that equal signs turns into one gigantic whatever. When you measure difficulty, as Philip was doing, seeing the vast crowds, seeing the hungry people, limited resources, Like, difficulty is ultimately measured by the person performing the duty. And so we're analyzing, we're thinking, we're formulating, how are we going to solve this problem? 
But did they forget that with God, all things are possible? And that there's nothing impossible with God? That he says it on the negative and the positive, just so that we are, are firm in our faith, that we are, are confident that there is absolutely nothing outside of his control. And so Philip is saying, back to John chapter 14, you, you keep talking about the Father, just show us the Father. You, you keep talking about this Father. I want to experience the Father. You're teaching us about the Father. Would you just show him already? And then Jesus responds to him back in John chapter 14, verse 9. Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? You know, there are people out there that, that say that Jesus never really claimed to be God, that he never really claimed his deity. I, I would point to one, this passage right here as, as one of the primary passages saying, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Even in earlier passages when the Pharisees are getting mad at Jesus, accusing him of blasphemy, this is, this is a, a proof that Jesus is claiming to be God. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. One of the things that I think being pragmatic about things, that one of the cures to that is just essentially just seeing it for yourself. Like there are often times when, when I'm wrestling with issues of faith that, that I, I, I pray, God, I, I just need you to show me. I, I, I believe. Help my unbelief. I feel like women are, are, are a little bit better at this. At least when I look at Colleen, she's way better at this than me. I remember a, a couple weeks ago, I, I was attempting to make this concrete countertop. And so I went and I got the concrete that I needed, and I got this big mixer and, and started mixing this concrete. And, and what I ended up doing was getting this like fast-setting concrete, and I put some hardener in this mixer. And before you know it, within 15 minutes, I had a 600-pound rock on my hands. And Colleen's just like, it's all right. You just got to have faith. You just got to pray. I'm a little bit more like, no, I need a chisel and a hammer. That's what I need. <laughs> no, no, let's just pray. Or, or something's wrong with the car. Something's making noises. You don't know what's going on. You, you may not have the, 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 the means to, to fix that right now. And let's just pray. Let's lay hands on it. It's like, well, no, I know why it's messed up. You, we we kind of, as guys, sometimes have this, we know why things have gone wrong. And if you just do X and Y, then, then Z will happen. It's, it's not rocket scientist. And, and when did you know, you know, four hours later, after chiseling out that rock and that mixer, G, or Colleen's over there, <laughs> Jesus answered our prayers. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, I can't feel my hands. My arms are numb. And I've got this, 600 pound block in pieces that I don't know what I'm going to do with. It's pragmatism. Like sometimes we, we just think too realistically about things and we rob God from working the miracle. We almost, in a way, prevent ourselves from seeing him at work because we need to be sensible about it. You know, when things don't make sense, we have to make sense of it. Instead of just allowing God to, to work and allowing God to do his thing. And that's one of the things I love about Philip, that, that he's constantly, you know, thinking reasonably about things. He's constantly thinking sensibly about things. And, and Jesus is testing that. He's making Philip face the reality of, hey, I am God, there is nothing outside of my control. Yes, yes, you can do the calculations, but, but faith isn't a formula. It's a matter of just, do you trust me? Do you have faith in what I can do? Because the, the math in a miracle is 
whatever, whatever, plus God equals whatever. He's going to do his thing. But how do we fight that today? I like to think sensibly. I like to think realistically. How do we fight that today? And, and is there a way that we can still be maybe biblical pragmatists? Can we still think sensibly and logically, but, but allow room for God to move in unexpected and supernatural ways? I think the first thing that we can do is that we can ensure that our pragmatism is biblical. What do I mean by that? I mean that the goals that we set for ourselves, do they align with biblical principles? Like, are we seeking God in, in, in the plans that we have for ourselves? That are we pursuing him? And, and as we pursue him, he is guiding our paths, our, our goals in light with God's word. I think the second thing that we can do to ensure that our pragmatism is biblical is do we explore scripture's specificity, both explicitly and implicitly? So they're, they're the easy ones, right? The, the Ten Commandments, for example. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal. That, you know, those things are, are pretty explicit. But then there are things that are more implicit. Some might call those gray areas where there's principles, how we're supposed to act towards one another, that we are to, to love our neighbors as ourselves. What, what does that look like? That, that, that depends on the context and the situation. There are more implicit ways that we are to go about things. And so do we explore scripture specificity when it comes to some of these issues? And then thirdly, do we work from what is clear in the Bible to what is less clear in the Bible? So there are things that are, are pretty much outlined for us that are pretty easy to follow, and then there are things that are not so easy to follow. And so a good way to, to even think for ourselves is how can we stay specific and, and work our things to maybe the things that are less clear and use those different biblical principles to apply towards the decisions that we make. But then I think the, the second thing that we must do is to know the difference between wise judgment and just simple obedience. The difference between wise judgment and simple obedience. Even when we're looking at scripture, it, it's helpful to understand the context. You know, we're, we're 2,000 years removed from when a lot of these stories that we're talking about it was a totally different time, a totally different context. Yet how do the principles that Jesus spoke into the lives of his disciples apply to us today in modern America, in light of technology, in light of just how our culture is? Pay attention to the context. But then we need to examine when a scriptural example is normative. So what that means is that, that they did things certain ways in, in, the, in the early Bible times that we just don't do the same way anymore, simply because of just how culture has changed. Like they didn't have to worry about technology. They didn't have to worry about mobile devices. They didn't have to worry about the World Wide Web. They, they didn't do all of these. They didn't have all of these things. It's, it's different. And so how can we examine when, when Scripture is, is using an example as, as a normative rule? So, for example, in 1 Corinthians, when they're talking about communion, there's a, there's a passage that talks about just one loaf of bread signifying the, the, the body of, of Christ. And so does that mean that we only use one loaf of bread when we celebrate communion as a people? That, that's not the point. And so it's, it's when are these things normative? John says in, in John chapter 16, verse 13, that the Holy Spirit is the one who ultimately guides us in the understanding of truth. That as we read through God's word, as we study the scriptures, there has to be this dependence on the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us into all truth. When it comes to our pragmatic ways, when it comes to us thinking sensibly, when it comes to us thinking just realistically, 
in light of what we know Scripture says about Jesus, in light of what we know what Scripture says about the Holy Spirit, that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that lives in you and me. That we are to be a comfort because the Holy Spirit is a comfort to us. How, how does all of this interact with the decisions that we make each and every day? Can we still be realistic but allow God to move, to still have faith in him, to still even, I would argue, expect him to move in supernatural and powerful ways? See, Jesus went right at Philip in this area. Some of us are more deep thinkers than others. And that's okay. Some of us are more short-triggered than others. And that's okay when we allow God to redeem those things. Some of us are a little bit more open up our mouth and insert foot that God uses those things to turn for his honor and his glory as we continue in this mission of seeing who all will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Don't allow our pragmatism to get in the way of him doing the supernatural. I'm going to ask the, the team to come back up and close us out in our final song today. As I think about Philip, I th I'm just thankful that he's not afraid to, to ask the question. He's not even afraid to challenge Jesus. And it reminds me that Jesus isn't afraid of our questions. He's not afraid of, of our realism, he, our, our perceived realism. Like Jesus is, is willing and able to meet us exactly where we are. He, he's willing to, to, to come find us, to help us, to, to guide us in, in whatever situation we find ourselves in. So if we have questions, then, then ask. Jesus, I need your help. Holy Spirit, I need you to, to help guide me in all truth. I mean, my mind says one thing, my heart says another thing. Please come and reconcile those two things together. And that is okay. We're not always going to have all the questions or all the answers, I should say. There may be seasons when we feel like we have way more questions than we do answers and, and we're hanging on by a thread and, and, and Jesus says, that's okay. Continue to pursue me because as you pursue me, I'm going to make you who I want you to be. I'm going to cause you to use those things for, you, for my honor, for my glory, it's going to be okay. And so I just find comfort in that. I find comfort in that for Philip because I'm much like him. I've got a chisel and a hammer in my hand while Colleen's just saying, have faith, have faith. Yeah. Let's stand together as we pray. Father, I've often prayed for you to do things just to wake us up, to wake me up. Something that's just so extraordinary, so out of the ordinary, things that can only be explained by your hand being involved in it. I think sometimes, yes, I believe, but I need you to help my unbelief at times. And just thinking about these disciples that you've chosen, these disciples that you've empowered, these disciples that you've entrusted with carrying on your mission, it just gives me hope. It's almost proof as we look at their faults and we look at their shortcomings that, that if I were writing the story, I wouldn't necessarily let people into my shortcomings or my failures yet we get this picture of how you redeem those things. You, you ultimately redeem everything. You redeem our lives. 
that with you all things are possible, namely that we have salvation, that we can now have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you for your love. We thank you for continuing to pursue us. We, we thank you for, for leaving the 99 to bring us into a relationship with you. We thank you for finding us like you found Philip. As we think about the price you paid on our behalf, the ransom you paid for our lives, the only thing we can do is stand here in awe of you, praise you, give you honor and glory. And then from this point forward, we, we carry on this mission of trying to make you known pointing people to you, of, of bringing people to you and just saying, just come and see. Come and see what he, what you are able to do. And so would you empower us today? Would you empower us to be so bold, so confident in our faith that, that when the calculations and the formulas doesn't seem to add up, we just continue to press hard and deeper into you that we would allow you to do your thing and get out of the way. So whatever that is in your life, I encourage you just lay that before him today. Lift that up to him today. Pray specifically what that thing is. I think sometimes we're a little too general in our prayers and if we want God to move in specific ways, we often just need to be specific in our requests to him. So just take a moment and lift that up to him. Again, we thank you and praise you for your love. Thank you and praise you for how you continue to guide and direct in our lives. In Jesus' name.